I was going to ask you about the mind of the spirit. Um, but I think I had a question about, um, you know, something that we've talked about quite often mm -hmm. and, um, having conversations about, um, the Imago Dei, the image of God in the human being and how God has created us functionally yeah. for his creation. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this yesterday and uh, Colossians 1, 10, um, it actually says that, um, Paul says this in Colossians 1, I'll start in verse 9, it says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Yeah. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. But I think um, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. So Paul, Paul lays out this beautiful prayer. Um, he basically talks about how he's praying for the people there. But I, I love that he says um, that God would fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. And he's going to talk there about um, bearing fruit in every good work. What does that mean to bear fruit in every good work? And if, if the Spirit fills us with um, wisdom and knowledge and understanding, it's the same thing from, even from the beginning. You know, even yeah. from the beginning of the scriptures, you see it through the scriptures where God says, um, I, I, I want to I give them my wisdom, my spirit, um, the, the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. It says it in Exodus 31. It's in Proverbs 3. The Bible says that God established the foundations of the earth through wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Um, and then it continues mm. to say this throughout. And then... And then um, Paul will go on in Colossians 3 to say that, that everything we do, all of our work, we should do as unto the Lord. Yeah. And we should do it by the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And so my question is this, is a lot of times, I, you know, in the past, I've looked at that phrase and I've thought, okay, um, have good wisdom to make good decisions, um, have knowledge so that I knew what I'm doing, you know, my work in the Lord. But I think it's more than that. I think mm -hmm. I think what what Paul has in view here is understanding that we were created in the image of God to bring authority and order. We were created in the image of God to create. And so I guess right. my question to you is this. The spirit gives us wisdom and knowledge and understanding to bear fruit in every good work. Do you think that has to do with our place, our function as the Imago Dei together, do you think that has to do with the function that we have as human beings to bring complexity and order into God's world? Is that a lens by which we're supposed to see our work as something that is, um, is, a, is, a, um, is a manifestation of the Imago Dei in us, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I believe that more and more. I, the more you and I study and look at the idea of the image of God, um, when we look at the creation account, Genesis, when God made the world and he made human beings to fulfill a certain functions, I think that that idea of the image of God moves through scripture and, in, and that's exactly what Paul is tapping into. This idea of the will of God is tied directly to understanding what it means to now be the renewed image of God. And it's singular. You see how it's his will. There is this one will that God wants for all human, be human beings, and particularly those who have been now brought into Christ, the true human being and the, the real, the true image of God. So, yes, I think that what Paul is talking about with the will of God has to do with being the image of God, which is about bearing fruit in the world, ordering the world in such a way where it better reflects heaven. So for, for me, and I know you would agree with this um, on our conversations the last three years now, is that human beings ultimately were designed to be the in-between creature 
And what I mean by that is in between heaven and earth where heaven would reflect into earth through the human being. And as the earth looked more like heaven, it would be a praise going up to God. So we would be the creatures by which the earth would look more like heaven and heaven's will would be done on earth. And in heaven's will being done on earth, the earth itself would be praising God. That is God's will. I believe that Paul is ultimately talking about that, but you're right. It's, it's more than it's, you know, it's more than just having wisdom or having knowledge. It's being able to, it's being able to understand what it means to be human. Right. And what it means to be human is to make the earth look more like heaven. So when I'm teaching along these lines, one of the things I say is this. If there's one thing that you get from what I'm saying right now, if there's only one takeaway, it's this. The will of God for human beings is that they would order the earth in such a way where it would better reflect heaven. Because as humans go, the earth goes. The earth will look more like heaven or less like heaven, depending exclusively on human beings. And so God is doing a work of bringing heaven to earth by giving the spirit to human beings who then work and order the world in such a way where the earth better reflects heaven. And for me, I found that if I just hold to that reality on a day-to-day -day basis, my life gets a lot more simpler. I'm not wondering what I need to do with my life. What does God want from me? It's obvious. I know what his will is. I am to be truly human, ordering the world so that it better reflects heaven. Right. And, and yes, our personal vocation, our personal purpose or calling, um, we discern through what our giftings are, what our personality is, you know, what we're talented yeah. in. I mean, it's really, yeah. hard to, it's really hard to work a career you're not talented for. So right, we discern right. those things on an individual level, but the Bible's focus and preoccupation is the will of God for us. Yeah. Yeah. In humanity. And the in in Genesis one, the first couple pages of the Bible, when God creates human beings, um, he reveals a little bit about himself. We don't know much about God in the first page of the Bible before he, before he creates human beings in verse 26, 27, yeah. and 28. But we do know he's a creator. Yeah. He's a builder. Yeah. And he's created us in his image to do that. Now, seven phrases in the first page of the Bible, God creates the the heavens and the earth in seven phrases with seven different speeches. The Bible says, and God said, and God said, and God said seven times. Well, it's interesting that when God um, had Bezalel, his general contractor, um, create the tabernacle, it actually says in there in, in Exodus 35 through 40 that the that the people of God, Israel, and the priests, they actually built the tabernacle, and there were 14, double sevens, 14 different things that God said to Moses. And it says in there 14 times in those five chapters, and they did exactly what the Lord had commanded, exactly mm -hmm. what God said. That's how they built it. So mm -hmm. double sevens. So what is the point? Seven is an is a is a number used as an imagery number in the scriptures it's it's used as a way to communicate the completeness of what god was expecting and in there um we see that bezalel was filled with the spirit of in exodus chapter 31 the first five verses he was filled with the spirit of wisdom knowledge and understanding so in here's my point in the yeah. same way that god created the heavens and the earth God calls human beings to create and build what he commands in the same way. And so, you know, the Bible says that that wisdom was with God in the beginning. That wisdom was right, there right. when he created the foundations of the earth. Yeah. That's a and good like point. you said, and I think for we as humans, hmm. when we have when we have the lens to see that, we realize 
everything we do matters. How yeah. we build relationships, how we build yeah. a life, how we build um, a business, how we build a ministry, how we, all of that, God expects us to build. He, yeah, he yeah. has created us to be creators. Yeah. To take what he has given us, the potential of the world, the potential in the ground, everything comes from the ground, the potential in the ground, dig it up, trees, minerals, metals, and create and flourish humanity and push humanity forward and bring complexity, not complication, but complexity into yeah. God's world. And it's just interesting to see that lens of the human vocation of the Imago Dei, that function of that we build and create just like God does. And God actually fills us with his spirit in order to do that. And so when yeah. Paul says that do all of your work as unto the Lord, um, it's not just do it with a smile. It's not just do it with kindness. Those are important. Right. It's not right. just... Um, be a good person, live morally um, as you're doing whatever career you've picked. Those are all good things. But I think ultimately it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger conversation or deeper conversation yeah. about the purpose of why we actually exist. Yeah. 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 That's a really good point. I haven't thought about that. Um, say that again, though, just, just the verse you're referring to when it talks about God building creation through wisdom and understanding. What is that verse? Proverbs chapter 3, I'm sorry, verses 19 and 20, says that God yeah. established the foundations of the earth through wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And yeah. And you see it in, it actually says it in Exodus chapter 31, Bezalel um, was the man that God chose to build the tabernacle. And it says that he was skilled in all artisanry work, in metal work, in woodwork. He got, it wasn't, it wasn't just spiritual things like God in, endued him with his spirit so that he could pray really good or that he could preach right, really good. Right. No, it says he was an artist. He was a carpenter. Yeah. He was a, yeah. a metallurgist. Yeah. He literally could take anything out of the ground and create something beautiful with it. And God gave him that ability. And then he went out and recruited a team to help build. And, and then those people were consecrated. And it was actually the priests of the tabernacle who were called to right. actually put their hands to work and build something. Um, that would be the place where God himself would come and dwell. Right. You know, I think it also says that in Job, though, where God says, you know, I've made the earth, something along those lines, like I made, he's challenging Job, you know, and I, you know, who are you to say these things? I've made through wisdom and knowledge, I've mm -hmm. made all these things. And so, yes, I think that ultimately wisdom and knowledge is tied to this idea of doing things in the earth that ultimately better reflect heaven. Because as we see through scripture in this, and I would say, you know, for our viewers who are watching right now, I would, I would challenge them to begin in their Bible reading, to begin to think very hard that the scripture is ultimately about God desiring to dwell with human beings in the earth. Yes. Heaven, the realm of God, is meant to be one with the earth. They're meant to overlap. They're supposed to have perfect exchange with one another with nothing broken. God and man in perfect interacting relationship. That's how the Bible ends. It ends with the book of Revelation, the people of God shouting for joy. Look, the dwelling place of God is with man and in the earth. So our job, in a sense, is to make the earth more, look more like heaven. Um, I don't know if this is the best way of putting it, but there's almost a sense of work in the world in such a way where God would be pleased to live. Yes. Almost um, a holy place for him to live. All, ultimately, that will happen in the new heavens and new earth. Yes. Right now, he dwells in us, and we are to live the sort of lives that are pleasing to him, a place where his, his spirit feels welcome. 
but it's in everything we do around us. And when we do that, when we're doing things in the world that make the earth better reflect heaven, it becomes a sign of what is to come in the future when that is perfectly fulfilled and God dwells in the earth with his renewed human beings. And so we work in the world right now as people showing signs of that ultimate future. And we work in the world with wisdom and understanding in such a way where the earth better reflects heaven. It's interesting that you say that because the, the picture of what you said of God's desire is that heaven would come to earth. Yeah. Not us trying to reach up to heaven, but that heaven right. would come to earth. And at the end of the scriptures in Revelation 21 and 22, we see a city, the new Jerusalem, the Bible says, coming down out of heaven, resting on the earth. And that is the, the rule and reign of God. It is the yeah. authority of God as king. But it's interesting that all the way from the beginning in Genesis, all the way through to the book of Revelation, there's two cities that are named, Babylon and Jerusalem. And they are yeah. compared and contrasted. Yeah. And it starts in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel in Hebrew, but we call it Babel. In Genesis 11, human beings, um, after, after they rebelled against God on the third page of the Bible in Genesis 3, human beings started taking power for themselves to make their own name great instead of honoring God. Right. Now, they were doing that in a, in a selfish way. To, to take control of what it means to define good and evil for ourselves. God wanted to be the only one who would define what um, real power was or real truth was. To define good and evil, he wanted to give that to humanity, but we decided to try to grasp for it ourselves in the garden and take yeah. over the definition. We are the ones. We want to define what's good and bad. We want yeah. to define how yeah. to live. We want to define what it means to be human. Yeah, we, we want to order the world in such a way where it benefits us yes. instead of reflecting the will of heaven. Yes, and that's what the Tower of Babel is. Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. The two cities that, that compare and contrast all the way through the scriptures, Babylon is mentioned 250 times. The first time is in Genesis 11. The last time mm. is, in, is in Revelation 19, where Babylon is destroyed and the new Jerusalem, the city of God, comes out of heaven to earth. Now, why, why do I mention this? Because Babel is the idea that human beings wanted to build a city up, a tower up to the heavens. That's yeah. the point of man. When we try to take over what it means to build our own way. We try yeah. to build ourselves up to heaven where yeah. God's saying, no, I want heaven to come down yeah. to where humanity is. God wants to dwell yeah. here instead of man, humans trying to get up to dwell with God up there or be equal to God. Yeah. God is saying, no, I'm coming to dwell with you. And the very last chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 48, um, the very last verse, it says, and there was a new city, and the name of it was, the Lord is there. Yeah, That's present. the whole point. Yeah, it the is Lord the is there. It is the dwelling present. place of God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, over my several years of study now, the thing that has challenged me the most is to say yes. If we believe in Jesus and we die, we go to be with the Lord. We're going to be in heaven. Right. The only thing that you and I are saying, though, is that at the end of the Bible, heaven and earth come together. Yes. The earth is renewed. It's actually the earth itself isn't destroyed. It says it's in first or second Peter. The elements of this world will be destroyed. And we think, oh, okay. Okay. Um, God's going to destroy the earth. Well, no, it's the elements. It's the things that corrupt this world. They will be gone. It will be purified. But Peter then says right after that, 
but we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth. That's right. So Peter is in line with Paul, who's in line with John. It's the idea of heaven and earth becoming one. Now you might say, well, Eric, who cares? At the end of the day, all right, we either live up there in heaven or heaven and earth are, are one. Does it really matter which one we believe? Well, in a sense, it does. Because if one day heaven and earth will be one, then we are the people now in the present showing signs of that future reality. So, yes, it does matter very much because it informs us on how we should live. Yeah. You know, what we're not what we're trying to do in our Christianity is to actually show the world through our acts and love and kindness that bring order to the world. We are showing the world what the world will eventually look like in the end. Yes. That God has indeed defeated the things that destroy and corrupt his world. Our way of life of love is a visible sign that those things have been defeated. And one day those things will be permanently removed in the new heavens and new earth. So our way of thinking of the future, our final destiny in a new heaven and new earth, informs us on how we ought to live right now. And it goes back to what I said a few minutes ago. When you do that, life gets a lot more easier. You're not thinking, you know, what does God want me to do? Um, you know, you're an image bearer. You're an order bringer. You're a justice bringer. You're the sort of creature that is reflecting heaven into the earth. And when you do, when you order the earth, a praise is going up to God in an advanced sign of what is to come. That's good. And that is ultimately the praise and worship of God. The praise yeah. and worship of God is, yes, when we sing songs, it is a praise and worship to God. When we read our Bible, when we pray, when yeah. we serve other human beings, it is a praise and worship to God. But all of that is under, I think, the category of when we function as the humans that God intended for us to be, mm -hmm. to bear his image correctly in the world. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I think that's, that's yeah. ultimately, I believe what Paul is saying in Romans 12, 1 and 2, to, to use all of who you are, all of your members, to rightly worship God, which is we bear the image of God the way God wants us to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, live morally, but that ultimately leads to us building and creating in his world um, for the glory of God and for the good of mankind. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's, you know, um, followers of Jesus came to him in Matthew 22, and they said, um, they brought him some money, and they said, hey, um, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Hmm. And Jesus said, you know, um, whose image is on the coin? And said, Caesar's image is on the coin. And he said, great. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Well, he was comparing and contrasting um, the image of Caesar versus the image of God. Because that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, right, right. ultimately, his ministry came to take over. He is now Lord yeah. of the world. Yeah. Not Caesar. At the time, the Caesars, the Caesar cult had dominated the earth at that time. Rome ruled everything. Right. And right. Um, Caesar was basically God to people. Right. And Jesus was like, no, um, I am Lord of the world now. And my image, the image of God is on the human. So he takes the coin and he says, whose image is on there? Give that back to him. Fine. Now give to God what is God's. Well, who has God's image? Well, we do. So Jesus, right, was, right. Jesus was making a statement much higher than, much, much bigger than just money or anything else, earthly, um, as far as like possessive stuff, possessions. He was saying, you have the image of God. Give to God what is God's. That means your whole life belongs to the creator in order to function the way God designed human beings to function. Yeah. And that yeah. is to obey him in ordering his world the way he wants. 
in functioning in his world the way he wants, in um, in bearing his image. And ultimately, I think that's what it means when it says bear fruit, right? Yeah. Jesus, yeah. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. You cannot bear fruit except being connected to me. So if he's the ultimate image of God, then we are bearing fruit. We can't produce our own fruit. It, it's produced in us and through us, but we can bear that fruit in the world. And, yeah. and so it's because we, yeah. have been, we have been made in the image of God. The Imago Dei, the image of God, is such an important foundational yeah. lens by which we see the scriptures that if we miss yeah. that, um, then we're going we're gonna to miss what it means to be human and, and our function in the world every day. Yeah, I think, and to t and to build on what you just said there, the importance of understanding the image of God, it also helps us to read Scripture better. It helps us to understand what Jesus's mission and ministry is about. That ultimately, this is about a restored humanity properly bearing God's image. And I think that we could just say this here, if we were going to keep it very, very simple. This is what we've been saying throughout this whole recording is that when we talk about the image of God, there's much that can be said. There's much that has been said. The image of God means this. The image of God means that. You and I have come to the conclusion that the image of God is basically this. We are the people who serve the function of ordering God's world so that it better looks like heaven. Yes. Therefore, image of God is primarily a job description. Yes. It is a vocation to make God in, when he says, let us make human in our image. This is about making a creature who will work in the world in such a way where it better reflects heaven, where the earth will come to know the creator who made it. No other creature on the planet has been given that job, that vocation. So when we talk about image of God, all you and I are saying is that we work in the world in such a way where it better reflects heaven. Yes. That in a sense, in us and in and through our work, heaven and earth have come together. That's an amazing thing to think about. The spirit lives in us. We have this treasure in earth and vessels. We are the place where heaven and earth our one and we go out into the world and we work in it in such a way where it better reflects heaven so for example dr paul dr paul osteen he's going to be going over to africa in a month or so he does it every year and he's going to be over there for three four plus months and he does surgery over there and here's the amazing thing i i always am interested in missionaries and medical missionaries um, because of the, the work that they do in terms of how it relates to the image of God. Is anybody sick right now in heaven? No. Does anybody have a broken bone or kidney failure or need a heart transplant or anything like that? No. Every time a surgeon performs a surgery to correct those issues, what that individual just did is right in that moment made the earth look a little bit more like heaven. A bone that is broken, since nobody has broken bones in heaven, when the bone is set back in place again, in one way, shape, or another, the earth better reflects heaven. So all we have to do is ask ourselves, really, day by day, moment by moment, is what I'm doing bringing order or disorder is what I'm doing, making the earth better reflect heaven or not. And when we do it that way, like I said, life gets a lot more simpler. <laughs> it does. And I, and I started with Colossians chapter one, verse nine, where it says, we continually ask God to fill you. Paul's prayer is that God would continually fill them with the knowledge of wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives. This yeah. is verse 10. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please yeah. him in every way. And then it defines what it means, bearing fruit in every good work. And here's what I love, this phrase, growing in the knowledge of God. You just said yeah. it a minute ago. 
it's not just how we live in the world. It's also how we get to know God through the word, through the scriptures. Yeah. We, we are drawn into a relationship with him to know him better. So yeah. being filled with the spirit that gives wisdom and knowledge and understanding is not just, can I be a good artisan? Can I be a good painter? Can I, can I make great coffee? Can I, um, can I be a good CEO? Can I be a great parent? Can I be a good teacher? Yes, that is all important. But it starts with knowing God and to live yeah. a life, like you just said, live a life in such a way that we, that we create and build a world in which God is pleased to live. So what does yeah. it mean to, um, to please God in every way, to be worthy of the Lord Jesus, yeah. to all of those things? Well, bearing fruit according to the image of God on us and to yeah. know him better. Yeah. And to know him better is the beginning, I believe, as it says in Proverbs 4, um, the reverence, the, the fear of the Lord. The, really, it's the awe of God. To, to, yeah, they to are. Look, yeah. Yeah. If I can say it like this, to look into God. Yeah. Look, look into yeah. him. Search for him. Yeah. Look for him in everything. That is the beginning of wisdom. Look yeah. for God. Who is God? What is he doing in the world? What is he doing in the heavens and the earth? What is his desire for us? God, what do you want from us? What do you want with us? What do you want for us? And I think that is the beginning of living a life where we really know him. Yeah. And when we say, I think, you know, it's like, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be, have a relationship with God. What does that mean? Yeah, that's yes, yeah. I yeah, I think that we could you, you know, uh, just as church church people in general define that better. Mm -hmm. We have a relationship with God, which is true. Amen. Glory to God. But I think that there's ways um to look at that and explain it in scripture that um that might give us a better understanding of of what it actually means to be in a relationship with him. Right. And along with that um, like you said, you know, you and I, the last couple of days have been kind of interested in what is this, what does the Bible mean when it talks about pleasing him? Yeah. And that's something that I haven't really studied out very much. Um, but what I'm shocked to discover is that it's in there much more than I realized. And I think there's almost a danger of talking that way, or, or maybe when we talk about pleasing God, there's a little bit of a pullback because we think, well, you know, it's not by works that we're saved. Well, we agree. Yeah, it's not by we, we we don't please him into loving us and right. saving us. We're not claiming that. Right. And so but because we we have been taught rightly to know that it's not works based, when we see something about pleasing him though, we almost kind of pull back. Mm -hmm. Or it's the flip side where we almost are uncomfortable talking about pleasing God because then the flip side is that we can displease him. Right. And we don't want to deal with the thoughts and the feelings that are generated from displeasing God. Right. But we have to go where the scripture leads us. Yep. And in the end, it's good news. This is here to help us. I believe ultimately in the, the, the little bit of study that I've been doing on pleasing God, that this is ultimately life. This is true life to live a life of that is honoring and pleasing to God as we bear God's image. And it's not as complicated as we think. And it's definitely, if it generates some, some anxiety to think about, Oh, life that pleases God. Uh, that's not thinking scripturally. It's actually much more generous and loving and caring and gracious than anything that's hard. Right. Um, or, or, or makes you feel bad. And it's, it's, um, I like this phrase. You see it in the New Testament. You see it in Romans, especially Romans 8. But God's covenant is a covenant of life and peace. Yeah. Malachi 2.5, his covenant with Levi, the, the priest in the Old Testament, um, is a covenant of life and peace. Deuteronomy 28 to 30 and 32 the children of Israel, God desires to have relationship with them in such a way that the covenant between them is life and peace. God says, look, come to me, the giver of all life, yeah, because it will be life and peace. We talked about the two cities earlier, Babylon and Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the word literally means 
um, Yeru Shalom. Um, it, it is the word Shalom, the city of peace, the city of life yeah. and peace. It, Jerusalem is used as uh, it's it's a real city, but it's also used in the scriptures to point to a bigger reality, which is um, the the role of life and peace from God to humans. Yeah. And we find that. And so, you know, as you're talking about pleasing the Lord, I think I think one of the th one of the ways that we can please the Lord in a real practical sense is to receive and embrace the covenant of life and peace through Jesus. Yeah. Through his life, death and resurrection, we find life and peace, shalom, not just not just the absence of friction and conflict, but peace literally means order. Yeah. To to enjoy the order that God gives. Yeah. To enjoy the proper way in which God has um he is the ultimate principle, uh, the ordering principle of the universe. He is, he, is, um, he is the one who truly defines what it means for us to live in order and in peace with him and with one another. And I think, like you were saying, I think the grace of God, one of the, one of the ways that I see the lens of the grace of God is to embrace God's blessing and gift to us of life and peace. Yeah. I mean, if I bring my children a gift and I give it to them, I want them to enjoy it. Right, and I want right. them to enjoy it all the time. Like if I, if I, we, we, a couple of years ago, we bought them, they love horses. They absolutely love horses. And we <laughs> bought them this mechanical horse that, that they can get. I mean, it's a, it's a good size. It's like the size of a miniature horse. You can ride it around the house and they have, they have like, wow. you know, all of the, um, all of the tack gear that you need, the saddle and everything. So wow. they, they take it off. They're learning to, how to take care of horses. At some point, I'm probably going to have to buy a real one. Ooh. And uh, and so anyways, we're, we're, you know, like they have enjoyed it for the last three or four years and they're getting too, almost too big for it now, but they still right. love this thing. And yeah. the joy as a father that they would embrace this gift and I would see them laughing about it and joking about it. And, you know, they show all of the, everybody that comes to our house, they show them this horse and that just brings joy to my heart because I wanted to buy them that gift. So, you know. Our, our heavenly Father is the same way. He, God's desire is that what He has blessed us with, we would enjoy. And I think that, uh, you know, the very foundation of pleasing God is just to enjoy the life and peace He gives. Yeah, I mean that's His ultimate. I think one of His yeah. central desires. Yeah, and um, this is something I think you and I would it would be good for you and I to consider and study more that I've been thinking about lately is the life he gives us that we get to experience is his life that he's experiencing. Mm -hmm. This isn't a life he creates for us. Right. It's his own life given to us so that we can experience the life of God along with God. Which is mind blowing. Is. I mean, and that, and I think again, that's, I think that's even tied into being the image of God. It is partaking in the very life of God. God is life. And he's literally given human creatures the ability to experience what he experiences as life. This is life to the full. Yes. This is, this is the life. And even in me saying that, I'm, I have trouble wrapping my brain around it. But here's what I just said. The life he gives us isn't a life different from his. It's his life. Yes. Shared with us so that we can, that's relationship right there. We are actually participating in his very life with one another. And that is mind boggling. Yes. He doesn't give us a life different than his. It's actually his yes. own. And um, I think John talks about that. I think that's what John is dealing with in the Gospel of John's. I think in his epistles, first, second, third John, that it, what John is trying to communicate to us is the life he gives is the very life of God. He it's he didn't create a life for us. He gave his very own life so that we can share in it and be. How can we not be in awe of that? Yeah. What generosity. Yeah. He didn't share this with angels. He didn't share it with animals. 
He shared it with human beings, the very life of God to say, this is what it feels like to live. Yes. This is what it feels like to have life. Yes. And I think that will be supremely experienced in the new heavens and new earth, or if you die and go to heaven, but ultimately in the new heavens and new earth to be bodily raised to experience that is where everything is going. Yeah. Life, life to the full, abundant, yeah. abundant life. As John yeah. says, um, you know, when, when, when Moses encounters the burning bush and it's, it's God's presence and, and Moses, yeah. you know, God tells him, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to have you lead the people and I'm going to go where I tell you to go. And Moses said, um, who shall I say sent me? And God yeah. says, I am that I am. And that yeah. Hebrew word there is the verb to be. So what God is saying is, I'm, I am being itself. I am the very essence of what it means to exist. And so yeah. you're, you're right in saying the very life that we have is not separate from. It is not a, it is not a, it's not a different, it's not compartmentalized it, as a new type of life that God created just to put in us. It is yeah. the very essence and, and nature of what it means um, to, to be connected to God himself. Yeah. It's that life. Yeah. And it's yeah. not separate from, it is in conjunction with, it is yeah. simpatico, the word for symphony, a togetherness. And yeah. that's, I think that's what happens when we experience I think it's what happens when we experience moments in life that we are so overwhelmed by the idea of what it means to exist. When I had, when I had my children, yeah. you know, when, when Tara gave right. birth to our girls, I mean, there's just, there's, how do you explain yeah. the very feeling yeah. that you feel yeah. of seeing a human being born? I mean, it's yeah. unreal. And I'm like, God, yeah. if this is anything like the, the fullness of your life, you know, because I think we, yeah. I think we will in the new heavens and the new earth. I think we will experience ultimately experience fully. like this is, this is, this is yeah. life. And God will say, that's my yeah. life. I, it's fully given. But even now through the giving of the spirit, that life is beginning to take root yes. in us. 